Good morning. I am very pleased to introduce the conference that is in Austin, but online for everybody. And I have now a short presentation that introduce what is the Academy. I'm pleased to have this conference again in Austin in cooperation with the University of Texas. So now, please, we have the, the presentation. Uh, the Academy is arranged in four sections and access is by election. It is, was founded by Theodor von Karman in 1960. Next slide. And the Theodor von Karman was very charismatic and moving everywhere in the world, creating a lot of activity. Next slide. There were several famous space pioneer member of the Academy, and uh, they were in Germany and in America. For instance, the first satellite, the three person on the photo are member, were member of the Academy. Next slide. And in uh, Russia, Yuri Gagarin became honorary member in 61 after his flight. Next slide. Valentina Tereshkova is still active in the academy and Alexei Leonov passed away last year and he was also very active. Next slide. Uh, Stark Draper was the president of the academy and he, he was known as the inventor of the gyroscope. Next slide. There was a list of space pioneers from America. And you see that we are speaking of the Van Allen belt, but Van Allen himself was a member of the academy. Next slide. In Russia, there was also a large series of uh, um, specialists. And recently in uh, Washington, we introduced Tom Stafford, who was a Apollo Soyuz uh, astronaut. Next slide. Uh, George Muller was president of the Academy. And here on the photo, that was at the time of the launch of Apollo 11 to the moon, and next to him is Ramon. Next slide. The Apollo 11 team was member, became member of the Academy, and today the only alive is Buzz Aldrin, and is quite active and almost every year uh, coming to our event and giving lecture. Next slide. In uh, China, we have uh, also elected the first from China. They are recognized as the United Nations. And if we look at our first cover of the first issue of Astronautica Acta, that initially was named Astronautica Acta, now it's Acta Astronautica, uh, is we can identify a huge series of, uh, of uh, space pioneers. Amazing. We publish this journal, and today we are ranked first in space and fourth in the world. We publish already six, 75 cosmic studies on many subjects. And it is interesting to note that uh, this activity is made with strong international cooperation. We have a book series in four fields, and we publish space diction space dictionary. So we had three summits and in Washington and 
and uh, Mexico, but the one in Mexico was having 11 Latin America head of a space agency. So that was a huge contribution of the academy in several subjects that, that need uh, to draw the attention. We, we have uh, about 25 to 30 conferences each year. There was the planetary defense, the realistic advanced mission in Italy, critical infrastructure, Romania, Ukraine, Shanghai in China, and the Human in Space, which is a life science conference, is this year in Moscow. It's amazing to know that the first one was in 62 uh, in Paris. The low cost planetary mission, and we pioneer a series of new concepts. For, it, for instance, the Academy was the first organization to introduce the concept of small satellites in 84. And if you look at the history, uh, all the activity after that uh, developed rapidly all over the world. We have a small satellite conference in Berlin and university satellite in many countries including developing countries, and also uh, in activity in space situational awareness, where we had the first conference in 2017, followed by one in Washington in 20. We are very proud to cooperate with the University of Texas to develop and push the subject of space traffic management. <clears throat> we have a long experience in the subject because we published in 2006 the first cosmic study on space traffic management. And you can see that at this time we already underlined the critical subject that were needed to follow. And in 2018, we published a second study on space traffic management. And this showed that we need to continue to discuss at conference to have the subject, the subject to evolve so that we have some comprehensive approach of the space traffic management. But just a word on how to enter the academy. Uh, I would like just to note that we have people in many countries, but the youngest is 33. So young people are invited to start to participate to conferences to participate to committee, technical committee, to participate to writing a study in a study group so that they are known and one day they can be elected in the academy. We, we wish you uh, a good subject to the conference there will be a lot of excellent paper, and I would like to declare the conference open. Thank you. All right. Well, um, that was excellent, Jean-Michel. Appreciate uh, uh, 
uh, IAA partnership. Appreciate uh, Lockheed uh, sponsorship uh, of this as well. And um, Diane, would you like to say some words? Absolutely. I, I have a few things to say. First of all, thank you so much, Bobby, Mariba, especially Ali, uh, Jean-Michel, uh, Fabrice, Corinne. Um, here we are again, <laughs> seven years. And I just want to tell you, looking at the, the people and the participants and, and the things that are coming through in the chat, this was like my my dream and my hope that we would all be able to participate. It's the silver lining, I, I have to say, because there are people that are here today that have always wished from the very first conference that I always wished could come and join us and that we would have a real robust international discussion dialogue and we do um, not only that I mean we have such great content this year for so many of us last year's conference was the last time that we were on travel um, the last time we were in a conference setting collegial and friendly and able to hug each other and and yet here we are again and it just like reminds me of what I say all the time, if you know me at all, and that is that every day is different on the Camino, but it's still the Camino. And so we remain committed. We remain committed to constructive growth and to flexibility as we grow. And so I am so pleased that I can introduce to you the person I was supposed to introduce uh, last year, but um, circumstances uh, sort of overtook us then. Only happily, I can I can I can tell you that this uh, the person I'm going to introduce to you right now is definitely a force of constructive growth and change. Um, I would like to present to you Kevin O'Connell, who is the former director of the Office of Space Commerce my former boss, best boss I've ever had, ever, hands down, bar none. Um, a person who has been in our community for decades and has exhibited, well, he comes from the intelligence community, so that says something, intelligence, but also leadership, wit, vision, integrity. And now we get Kevin unplugged, so let's rock and roll. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Co-chair Jean-Michel Mariba, uh, Diane, uh, thanks very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm also thankful to the sponsors of IAA, UT Austin, and Lockheed Martin for inviting me to speak today. Um, as usual, there's an incredible lineup of both speakers and participants in the, in the conference uh, in what are many of the world's leading experts on what we've come to call space traffic management. So as Diane says, this is the, the first time since my appointment expired at Commerce last Wednesday at noon. Uh, and so I'm speaking to you, of course, as the former director of the Office of Space Commerce. Uh, that makes me a little bit sad, but I'm very proud of what we were able to accomplish over the last two and a half years, uh, both in this area and, and elsewhere. Uh, if you'll indulge me, former directors often begin by saying thank you to a number of people, and I'd like to take a few moments to do that here as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank my former colleagues, Diane is online, but Mark Daly, Mark Mulholland, Brian Bates, Jenny Meehan, Doug Brower, even others. Uh, for their extraordinary support over the last two and a half years, as well as other folks from the department, organizations like NIST and NTIA and NOAA, who were extraordinarily helpful uh, to us as we took on the, the mantle of, of the SPD-3. Uh, or the occasional call from the secretary, you know, one, one even at three o'clock in the morning one day, and that's a story I'll tell someday, but, but uh, not so much today, actually. Um, there wasn't a day in our time at OSC that we didn't think about mitigating the space debris and space congestion problems. Uh, some of you have heard me say before that SPD-3 was announced at the same time my appointment was announced at the White House. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, that's gonna be an incredibly large job in addition to our advocacy and industry engagement and, and other missions. And it proved to drive resources, uh, the lion's share of resources over the last two and a half years Although not to the exclusion of those other missions, uh, there are real reasons why industry needs an executive branch advocate focused on issues both at home and abroad. And that's a conversation for another day. Thanks are also in order to our interagency colleagues at Defense, at NASA, at FAA, at State, uh, at FCC, 
uh, even others who worked diligently and collaboratively uh, in response to SPD3. And then separately with our international partners, our extraordinary international partners who can bring so much to bear on the many different aspects of the space traffic management challenge. Let, let me highlight just a couple. You know, Defense has been an incredible transition partner. During my last week in office, we actually finalized the DOC DOD memorandum of understanding that will drive some of the technical partnership over the next few years. The regular discussions between our two departments have ranged from understandably technical and system related details but also to discussions about how to make sure that the taxpayer has efficiency uh, as we collectively tap into the commercial market. Okay, space, the Space Council's user advisory group pointed us to some important issues like data modeling and quantifying uncertainty in space that are inevitably part of this discussion here over the next couple of days, but also the continuing discussion between our agencies. A very different example, uh, right before my departure, we held discussions with the German government and the United Arab Emirates as part of a larger US government discussion, mainly about space traffic management and civil and commercial partnerships uh, in this arena. Uh, the enthusiasm and energy of our, our international partners, uh, also including the Commonwealth countries, the EU SST, Japan, just to name a few, uh, was an important inspiration to me and a source of confidence that we can move fast if we work together. NAPA, the National Academy of Public Administration, highlighted the intensely collaborative approach that we're gonna be required to bring all of these communities together uh, in order to make rapid progress in the face of a growing complexity of the space debris problem. And of course, they emphasize the need for action now. And I think everybody on this call uh, actually understands that. That's why we're here, here today. Uh, you've got a wonderfully packed agenda dealing with top technical and economic issues, the latter obviously uh, of great interest to me, to help address improved space traffic management, as we, or as we've come to informally call it, space traffic coordination and management. Whatever the bureaucratic politics of the last four years, or even the last decade, what you can be assured of in the US government is a cadre of officials who worry a lot about the space debris problem and its impact potentially first and foremost on the souls aboard the International Space Station, but also to the billions of dollars of investment in US and allied space capabilities. Looking ahead, they're also greatly worried about how collisions and congestion could potentially impede rapid advancements in space exploration and space commerce. So given that we have to move quickly and smartly, the question should not be where this mission is seated. And I'm reminded of the, of the famous uh, basketball quote, uh, I think the, it's called the wooden effect, uh, which is hurry, but don't rush or be quick, but don't hurry. In other words, move fast, but move smartly as well. And I think that's very much where we are right now. First of all, the space traffic management mission has been and will continue to be a whole of government mission, full stop, okay? The much bigger question in my mind is how government is going to effectively harness the energy of the private sector across the incredibly complex value chain, if you will, of space safety information and the actions that are driven as a result of it. We are already doing this in areas like our plans for lunar exploration and even one of my favorites, satellite imagery, and we need to do it here as well. Effective government industry partnerships are absolutely key to making rapid progress in this area as the space environment becomes more complex. One dimension of this problem, of course, is how to improve communications between the government and commercial operators, commercial space operators or space operators generally, but also among space operators themselves. As most of you know, Commerce and DOD are in the process of transitioning responsibilities for conjunction notices to private sector and international space operators. This is something that we've worked on in DOD's Sprint Advanced Concept Training Exercises, a uh, very welcoming environment, by the way, for international partners, both civil and commercial, uh, if, if folks uh, wanna participate in that, uh, really to understand topics like communication between different space operators, different countries, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How will governments transfer custody of space objects, for example, to commercial entities, and how might custody or other pertinent technical information be transferred between civil and commercial partners. 
How will international partners communicate effectively the details about the space environment? And how will we do it in a world where swarms of small sats and maneuverability are norms, not the exception? Academia has an important role to play here as well. We routinely heard in the Office of Space Commerce about the lack of academic research in this area, not, not being enough. Academia is potentially another important hub for exploration and experimentation of new concepts for data analytics, communications, and many, many others. How are we going to bring in a crush of data from a wide variety of sources and provide a coherent and trusted picture of the space environment. So a quick shout out to all of the graduate students that are with us today uh, who are going to quote knock our socks off uh, in, in order to uh, provide new innovations in this area. The title of today's workshop points us to some priority issues as we work through this. Trust but verify, a phrase that some of us will remember uh, had its heyday based on an old Russian proverb in the days of the Cold War points to the need for full confidence in the data being gathered from and provided to space operators, but also some independent capability to check positions in order to help improve our understanding of precisely where things are in the space environment. Incentivizing compliance is another helpful term because it speaks to the need to think as much about the economics of the space debris and space congestion problems as the technical ones, although both are obviously very important. Space traffic management has never been about, quote, telling people what to do, as some people chided me over the years. It is as much about helping create incentives for responsible behavior in space so that blunt and frankly uninformed regulatory instruments do not have to be employed. When we worked with our colleagues at the FCC earlier this year on their orbital debris rule, we found ourselves wanting more technical data but we especially were looking for more economic and financial incentives uh, associated with responsible space behavior. Let me stay on this point for just a minute. You know, when we talk about this as an economic matter, uh, you know, what, what, how are we thinking about it? What we're living through right now is a revolution in space based by applying commercial practices and efficiencies to a traditional government acquisition model for space. That's resulted in lower barriers to entry and lower costs associated with space. And that in turn has created a new wave of entrepreneurial activities from high school students to senior researchers, from traditional space countries to emerging space actors to envision new ways of, of, of exploring the heavens and, and creating new ways to improve our lives here on earth. And their efforts are increasingly supported by a wave of private sector finance you probably saw the announcement yesterday of almost $9 billion of private investment in space activities last year uh, in spite of COVID. While remaining mindful of the safety and sustainability aspects of the problem, what economists will worry about is how failing to deal with the space debris and traffic management problem now could require mitigation measures, adding fuel, protective mesh, heavier metals, et cetera, that could actually reverse these trends by adding costs to space operations. We read every day about the increasing numbers of satellites headed to space, such as SpaceX's record-breaking 143 satellites launched on Sunday. The number of space objects will continue to grow very quickly for the foreseeable future, putting considerable pressure on us to make progress with our STM efforts. But increasingly, the larger number of satellites is not the only dimension of the problem, as propulsion, refueling, and proximity operations are on our doorstep. The pace of innovation is breathtaking here and, and demands that we make progress in our efforts in improving SSA and STM. Some of the pathways to success lie in the work already done if allowed to continue. SPD3's direction to leverage commercial capability seems to me to still be an inevitable way to make progress and keep up with it at speed as the problem changes. Before Thanksgiving at Commerce, we actually held an industry day involving over 200 commercial entities with potential capabilities that could be brought to bear on this problem. Some lie at the space end of the spectrum, the sensing piece of the spectrum, while others lie in areas like analysis, cloud computing, cybersecurity, uh, and a whole range of others in that, what I've called that value chain to create that trusted environment. The system by which we manage space traffic today is necessarily a closed system, 
making the public data we rely on incomplete. The open architecture approach already envisioned and already underway in our efforts at commerce will allow for the open exchange for information, of information, I should say, and tools at, to provide a basic space safety service that is more timely and accurate than is publicly available today. That's the bare minimum of what the growing space economy will need in order to grow and diversify. That basic space flight safety service then provides the foundation for a whole new generation of commercial services. And again, we are already seeing commercial activities that are designed around an assumption of improved conjunction analysis and things that can be done beyond that. Uh, very exciting. Let me speak briefly to a couple of other topics on the agenda. First, active debris removal. During my last few months at Commerce, we included a fair conversation, set number of conversations with ADR entrepreneurs, enthusiasts, and others. Uh, ADR has its own technical, legal, uh, policy, and economic complexities, and I'm delighted to see a rich conversation in the workshop over the next couple of days on its many different aspects. As we think about the space debris challenge, though, there are four strategies we can employ, and I'll ascribe this to Administrator Bridenstein. First is avoiding the creation of new space debris, then improving SSA, enhancing space traffic management, and then active debris removal. They're all important and they can all be worked on simultaneously. Our efforts at Commerce, driven by SPD3 and working with the interagency, was overwhelmingly focused on improving SSA and helping think about the basis for improved STM. Because deepening our understanding of the space environment and how objects actually operate and behave in space is so foundational, it demands the highest priority in the near term, but it will also help advance ADR as, a, as an important tool for the future. The rules of the road conversation must also continue in order to inform STM. The good work already underway within our governments, with international standards organizations, and with commercial industry must continue. Uh, kudos to our colleagues at NASA for releasing its Spacecraft Conjunction Assessment and Collision Avoidance Best Practices Handbook as a key contribution to this discussion. These discussions must heavily leverage commercial capabilities or commercial firms, given the speed of innovation and the new missions coming into the market. Space security closes out the agenda for tomorrow. The importance of the relationship between security and commerce are well understood in many different domains, they require even greater exploration in the space domain. On the one hand, the volume and diversity of commercial space activities demands an adjustment of how we think about space from a security perspective. What will be the new norms and best practices for space? And how will we incorporate the rapidly growing role of the private sector in our thinking about space? This is another area where our efforts here on STM is an essential part of that equation. Enriching SSA provides essential information about space safety and sustainability, but also forms the foundation of improved transparency in space to, support, to inform security decisions. Work at the nexus of cybersecurity and space systems, such as we codified in Space Policy Directive 5, is another foundational capability that requires considerable attention. I started this talk by thanking my colleagues uh, in, in the government uh, but I also need to thank everyone who is participating in these discussions today and others in the community of people that work on SSA uh, and STM. What I think we have succeeded in doing over the past few years is to elevate the discussion about the importance and the challenges of, of, of SSA and STM, and frankly, the risks of doing nothing. Okay, which we, 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 are, we, cannot, we no longer have that luxury. We've elevated, we've elevated the discussion from the purely technical uh, to one which has got much more public recognition and political recognition as well. And, and I think that's, that's a, a very positive thing. And so I'm thankful to our Congress, of course, for providing the resources uh, and the mandate to OSC to move forward on parts of this mission. It's time to keep advancing, not, not looking back. So with that, uh, Jean-Michel, Mariba, Diane, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Let's get to work. Uh, there's a lot to be done, and I'm looking forward to some of the discussions planned over the next couple of days. A group of extraordinary people focused really on making progress. And with that, I'll look forward to a couple of questions. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for that. And uh, Diane, do you want to handle some questions for Kevin? 
Sure. Um, you mean just pose the questions that are here in, in the uh, chat function? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kevin, this is there's one question in here, and it's a doozy. Who would you want to hold responsible in the event of a fatal crash of a working satellite with the debris from an ASAT test? I think the country that launched the ASAT test would be would be the, the easy answer to that. Uh, again, obviously, this is an area where we have to look at a whole range of issues that lie at the nexus of commercial behavior, civil behavior, and, and security behavior, if you will, in space, and, and what constitutes responsible behavior across all of those. Well, here's another one, and this is also an excellent question, one that I have a, a personal interest in hearing your response. What's your advice to whomever takes over your former job, and what should their priorities be, and what landmines should they be aware of? Well, so uh, it is a great question, and uh, folks have been asking me, you know, what what's your advice going forward? Uh, the, the first and foremost thing I would say, and I, I, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that's on this call, uh, this is a problem that didn't change on election day. It didn't change on inauguration day. Uh, it's a problem that pro possibly got a tiny bit worse, you know, every day that we don't deal with it. And so regardless of whatever orientation uh, of the next administration, this is a problem that must be dealt with, obviously. Uh, the other is let's keep moving forward. Let's not go back and do a, a rethink of everything. Uh, you know, this, is, this has been a story. If you go back and look over the past decade, this is a story of, of organizational complexity uh, in multiple organizations overlaid by one, the rapid progress of commercial space activities that are moving at lightning speed. And so that just added to the problem. Uh, we have to be able to address this. You know, I, I like to say that if we create a system that actually solves this problem or mitigates this problem for 2020, we won't succeed because in 2023, it's gonna be a very different problem. And so we have to, as hard as this is now, you know, uh, uh, you know we have to be, be able to create a system that's adaptive going forward. I think we have a good start in the work we've been able to do at Commerce in partnership with our agency partners. Thank you. So what do you think the biggest barriers to collaborative problem solving in space traffic management will be? So I, I think the key here is, I think many of the ingredients are already in place. And again, when I talk about the commercial world, it's that I see so many potential solutions. I think the key, and, and Napa focused on this quite a bit, uh, is how do we harness, how do we bring all of these things together? Uh, how do we have the resources to do the collaborative work? You know, again, at Commerce, Diane knows this, uh, we've already had a wide range of conversations with international partners, we're working with our interagency partners, et cetera. How do you draw a big circle around all of this and make sure that it's all effectively employed? Uh, on occasion, someone will say, well, gee, we don't know how we can participate in this. You know, uh, uh, one of our allied partners has said, we don't know how we can participate in this. We don't have any space capability. The reality is this value chain that I keep talking about is something that has so many areas for so many people to collaborate and, and participate that you know, it's, that's the good news. How do we bring it all together? And that needs to be the focus going forward because a lot of the pieces are already in place and can be leveraged quickly if they can be leveraged collaboratively. Well, to continue on the collaboration theme, we have another question that touches upon that. And I, I want to just mention that you made a lot of, you made some people happy. I saw this in the chat, uh, bringing up ADR. Um, so you mentioned that ADR has its own granularities. And the question is, how can policies be developed to ensure that we keep that global collaboration intact? In, in the ADR field? Yes. Uh, again, I, I, think, I think it's just another piece of the, of the solution set going forward. Uh, I think the foundational SSA work that I've talked about and that we've worked on together is absolutely key to enabling ADR. Uh, you know, as we sort through some other details, uh, you know, some of us, uh, you've heard me talk before about uh, confers and the early work on standards in the satellite surfacing servicing arena. Uh, is there not a parallel in the a, a parallel discussion uh, in the ADR world where? technical concepts, uh, you know, legal concepts, others uh, are being worked proactively as we try to improve the space operation, our understanding of the operational environment. 
think we, this is going to be the last question because I think we, we have a, a panel to go to, but this of course. as well. Um, SpaceX and its pioneering technological success in making space launch boosters reusable um, have had a massive and even revolutionary impact. The question is, do you foresee a similar massively impactful technological change on the horizon? If so, what would it be? And beyond the, um, the obvious uh, RPO items. Well, you know, I, I'm, a, as I've said many times before, I'm very bullish on satellite servicing uh, because it really changes the economics of space, if you think about it. Uh, and again, uh, I've, I've actually said this, I said this, you know, probably a month ago to the secretary, things we were talking about just two years ago are now in demonstration or operational in the market. And that speaks to the speed at which things are coming in, into the market. Uh, and so in the satellite servicing arena, you're going to have inspections, you know, you have the Northrop Grumman example as a starting point, you're going to start with things like inspections, but you're going to quickly get to a point where refueling and robotics and, and other things repair, if you will, uh, are going to be part of the equation in space that will again change the economics of space in, in, in fundamentally different ways. And I spoke too soon. I, I uh, was shorting you by 10 minutes and we simply won't have that. So <laughs> we're wondering how this works now. So they, they can vote for which questions they're more interested in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm, I'm you know, sort of playing empress here. So I'm picking the ones I like. Um, let's see. How do we reconcile commercial and corporate interests with other stakeholders and what is often termed as external externalities? So I think they gave an example. In the Earth system, actors with interests in outer space are multiple and with different perspectives and objectives. So I think the question is, uh, how do we reconcile all those different interests among the stakeholders? Similar to the question about global collaboration, I think. Sure. And, and again, you know, in, in my early days at Commerce, I had a handful of people say to me that commercial actors don't care at all about space safety. And if you thought about that for five seconds, you would realize that's actually a very silly statement to make. In fact, we've seen not only some very interesting ideas in industry about improving space safety. Uh, you know, we're also seeing industry participation. We, frankly, we need to have industry participation in things like standard setting, et cetera. You know, we, we have all explored some aspect of parallel in air traffic, maritime traffic, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the extent to which there are lessons to be learned in those areas. One of, in, in the maritime area, industry actually takes the lead in helping set some of those standards. And so um, obviously there will be, be competing interests at times. There, those will have to be reconciled. But to say that industry doesn't care about this or industry doesn't have interesting ideas, I would argue is exactly wrong. You know, is that industry is actually both incentivized and interested uh, and making sure that space stays safe and sustainable for the near future. How we integrate those, again, drawing the circle around all of our collective efforts, that's the big challenge going forward. This is another interesting one. Um, this, this question acknowledges that it's very difficult to move through formal and, and national proposals at the UN and is asking instead how, how you think we could create common areas or baby steps that will help us progress uh, and, and make progress among our international community? Well, again, I, I, think, I think this work is w already well underway. Uh, you know, the, the LTS guidelines in the UN, uh, you know, how we have made progress on norms of, of international behavior. It's an early conversation, but it's a conversation that is already well underway. Uh, my view is, it continues to be, that these have to be bottoms up conversations, not top down conversations. You know, in other words, because of the speed and diversity of what's going on commercially and its overall percentage, if you will, of the global space economy, we have to incorporate those realities into how we're thinking about space from a governance perspective. And so again, good news is those conversations are already underway uh, in, in lots of different forums. We have to keep those going, but keep them informed by what's going on, if you will, you know, on the ground, pardon the phrase, in space. This is another interesting one. Um, this question is, uh, wants to know your perspective about initiatives that are open source, um, like Eyes in the Sky and IBM plus U Universe of Things, or rather Internet of Things. 
So, uh, you, Diane, you mentioned at the outset that, that I'd come out of the intelligence community and, and you know, I, uh, I was exposed at an early age to concepts like crowdsourcing, well, not so early in age, but, you know, crowdsourcing and, and, and open source information and things like that, uh, potentially very valuable tools in the arsenal uh, to, to helping improve what we're trying to do here, which is to keep space uh, safe and sustainable. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in those initiatives and seeing what they can contribute. Again, like all others, we have to validate what is, you know, what is available, what people thinking are thinking about, what people are saying, uh, you know, is, as we do in so many other areas in this open information world, uh, but they're potentially important tools in, in our toolkit here. This is an, an interesting question because it's a bit out of the, the wheelhouse from which you um, have recently emerged because it deals with launch. But the question is, at what point will debris concerns begin to impact launch licenses? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, if I'm remembering correctly, I think Peter Beck of Rocket Labs has just started to talk about how launch is becoming a more complex activity uh, in space. And so I don't, I don't want to speak to the specifics of launch licensing per se, but finding the windows. This is a real world example of what I worried about earlier when I talked about the dampening effect of this, uh, of the space debris and space congestion problem on the growth of space exploration and space commerce. Uh, and so we're not very careful and move very swiftly now uh, to try to mitigate this. You're going to see a drag on the system uh, I have been, it, it's, it's a dubious quote of mine, but I've often been, you know, I have been quoted in the past as, as saying that this was the speed bump on the path to the trillion dollar space economy. Uh, it is clearly the thing that can slow all of the things down that innovators are trying to do, and frankly, that we want them to do. Well, that, that's a great lead into this, this question, which might be our last. Um, this one pertains to merchants and guardians issues of business and security mindsets and how they're evolving and asks what changes need to occur on the Guardian side to make STCM or space traffic coordination and management work? I, again, I think uh, we're at the front end of, and I look forward to the panel tomorrow to, th to think about this. You know, we're at a point where we have to give due consideration to the growth of commercial space as we think about governance and norms and things like that. How are we going to incorporate those you know, on the one hand, if we think about traditional space activities, uh, you know, and, and, you know, things that go on between governments in space, you know, what would fall into the domain of space domain awareness, as we call it today, you know, compared to what I just talked about a minute ago, where we're going to routinely have satellites moving right up next to other satellites or space objects, right, you know, we have to change the way we think about space from a security perspective to incorporate these new innovations that are coming forward in the market. Again, early days of that, um, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll make progress on that going forward. And now we are at, nine, at 8, 8.50 Central Time, 9.50 Eastern Time. And so thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks a lot, much. brother. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so yeah. So with that, we'll we'll conclude our our, our keynote for the day. And um, basically, we're gonna take a ten minute break. Uh, so so be back in ten minutes, where Diane will be the moderator uh, for for a great uh, um, you know question and answer session related to um, you know uh, air air traffic and how that relates to. Um, uh, you know, airspace and orbital space and, and these sorts of things. So be back in 10 minutes and thank you very much.